Um, so hello and welcome. Um, welcome to this very special live edition of the New Mexico Humanities Council uh, program series starting conversations on the subject of Black Dem New Mexico. This program is generously supported by the McCune Foundation. And my name is Bethany Tabor. I will be hosting and moderating this conversation this evening. And first, I'd like to thank all of you for being here tonight and tuning in. And of course, I'd like to thank, make a huge thanks to all of our speakers for being here and for all the work they've put toward developing what promises to be a really great event. I want to acknowledge also that the New Mexico Humanities Council operates from and is headquartered on the traditional land of the Pueblo people. And we pay our respects to the elders, both past and present. Tonight, we are joined by an archivist, a professor, a historian, and a scientist who will each share their own insights into the history of Blackdom and its influence on contemporary life. It's a great opportunity to hear from such an interdisciplinary group of people. And though everyone gathered here tonight is speaking on the same subject, there will be differences and even some disagreements. Those are inevitable. Uh, even with that, I trust that this discussion will be enriching and valuable for everyone who has joined and everyone participating. We'll begin with an introduction to each panelist and they will discuss their work individually. I'll ask a few questions in the beginning to get us going, uh, get us started on a conversation. And then I'd like to open up a Q&A between the speakers and the audience. Um, during this time, you can drop your questions in the chat. I'll, I will read them aloud and the speakers can respond. Um, please also feel free to write down your questions in the chat as they come to you during the panelists' presentations and opening remarks. Um, I will strive to get to each and every one of those questions. Um, and finally, as a general housekeeping rule, uh, I do ask that everyone please mute their mics when not speaking. So without further ado, let me, let's meet our speakers. Um, first up, I'm excited to introduce Janice Dunahoo. Janice is an archivist for the Historical Society of Southeastern New Mexico. She is a public historical speaker for local government and civic organizations, contributing author for publications such as West Texas Historical Association Newsletter, Wild West Journal, True West Magazine, Texas New Mexico Border Archives Journal, and Roswell Daily Record newspaper. She is the weekly historical columnist for the Roswell Daily Record under the heading of Historically Speaking. She's a contributing author for a book titled Notable Black Women in Texas History, which is in progress. And she was a panelist for the Western History Association Conference of 2020. Janice, I'll let you take it from here. Thank you so much. And I um, feel very honored to be with my esteemed colleagues that I'm speaking with tonight and panelists. And thank you for the invitation. Um, I've known Timothy for a while, but it's nice to meet the rest of you, and I'm excited to hear what you have to offer on Blackthumb. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the questions that Bethany posed for me um, to begin with. And those questions were, what is the process of collecting archival material on ghost towns in general? Has that process been the same for Blackthumb? And how large is the Blackdom Archive at the Historical Society for Southeastern New Mexico? So I'm just going to use that as part of my presentation. I'm just going to work it in. But I will start with that, trying to answer her questions. And um, what I have is a town often becomes a ghost town because the economic activity that supported it, usually industrial or agricultural, has failed or due to natural or human caused disasters such as floods, prolonged droughts, government actions, et cetera, uh, is factors leading to the abandonment of towns in, which include depleted natural resources, economic activity, shifting elsewhere, railroads and roads bypassing or no longer accessing the town, human intervention, et cetera. Archiving materials on a ghost town in general would consist of collecting stories, literature, articles, genealogy of residents, maps, pictures, economic activity, how the town came to be and why it failed. The archiving and collecting process and preservation of the history for any ghost town would be the same. The process for Blackdom is the same, if anything, 
uh, because of its uniqueness and its reason for being would make it more valuable in collections possibly than others. The problem with collecting and preservation of materials for blackdom in my experience is the fact that there are virtually no buildings left. Most ghost towns you have some buildings, some things to go on. Many of the residents relocated uh, after Blackdom closed, which kind of left a vacuum in collecting photos, uh, family stories, old letters, postcards, et cetera, describing the daily life of the residents. The repository at the Historical Society for Southeastern New Mexico, although it's not as large as we would like, is probably the largest in the state. To my knowledge, it is. We have a lot of uh, students that come in for what we have to offer. So moving on, hopefully that answers those questions. Moving on, I'm going to do what I do best as far as writing columns and researching. Um, and I like to think of Blackdom as a, I like to think of it as the daily life, what the people did and how they lived and, and the progression of their days there. So what I did is I, I just picked some newspaper articles that I feel like kind of describes hit and miss from beginning to end. So we'll start with the Santa Fe, New Mexican, dated October 1st, 1903. And that is a town and settlement is being organized in the southern part of Chavez County with the artesian belt, some few miles from the Pecos Valley Railroad. The promoters of the settlement expect to settle 10,000 people at one time so as to avoid the enactment of a special law by Congress debarring anyone but settlers from certain townships. The settlement promoters style themselves the Blackdom Town Site Company and May 1st, 1904 has been decided upon as the opening day. The officers of the company, which is capitalized at $10,000, are F.M. Boyer, President, Reverend L.N. Jones, Vice President, Professor D.G. Keyes, Secretary, and Burl Dickinson, Treasurer. The address of President Boyer is Dexter, New Mexico. While artesian wells are to form the basis of the water supply for the town site, the company expects to operate a large number of irrigation pumps with pumping systems. The president of the company has written to the secretary of the Bureau of Immigration asking for 500 or more of the Chavez County pamphlets. He also wishes information regarding pumping systems and the pumps best adapted to the irrigation in New Mexico. The company is also desirous of securing concessions from the railroad on which their colonists will have to travel. Most of the colonists will come from the south and bring with them bull and swine. A canning factory is also to be erected at, Black, at the Blackdom town site. So the next one I have is the Roswell Daily Record, August 16th, 1909. The second Baptist organized Sunday school. The General District Missionary of Arizona and New Mexico with a number of members of the Second Baptist Church of Roswell visited the Blackdom Settlement in the southwest part of town Sunday and found quite a number of visiting friends at the home of F.C. Collins. Upon learning that there was no Sunday school among them, steps were taken by the missionary to organize them into a religious body. With the consent of those who were there, the Second Baptist Church Sunday School was organized for the worship of the Lord by the missionary J.W. Bell. They left the school in charge of Reverend W.D. Prophet Pastor. We wish to see great results among the people of the Blackcomb Settlement. Okay, moving on to the next article, Santa Fe, New Mexico, dated October 30th, 1910. School Census, Superintendent of Public Instruction, James E. Clark today had a letter from Blackdom, 20 miles south of Roswell near Dexter, Chavez County asking for advice as to curriculum. The letter states that Blackdom is the only exclusive Negro settlement in New Mexico, that the people have taken up 10,000 acres in homesteads and will install a pumping plant. The community has built a commodious schoolhouse and now ask for assistance in arranging for the curriculum and a teacher. 
Moving on to Artesia, Pecos Valley News, dated December 7th, 1911. The town is now in pretty full progress and they're moving forward with uh, community activities. So this one is titled Thanksgiving. The Blackton population has imbibed the spirit of the Valley Times and organized the Boosters Club. This club gave a banquet Thanksgiving evening. Blackton is the town 18 miles south of Roswell in the Pecos Valley. Francis Boyer was the toastmaster of the evening. Toast were responded to by the following gentlemen. Immigration, W.M. Young. Our school, James Eubank. What we produce, Daniel G. Keys. Then there was a musical interlude, and then it follows with Real Estate by W.T. Williams, Pumping and wind Windmills by Clinton Ragsdale, Possibilities in Livestock by George Wilson, Another Musical Interlude, Business Opportunities by G.W. Wilson, and finally Homesteading by Monroe Collins. Songs to enliven the occasion were sung by the Dixie Chorus and the best interest in instrumental music obtainable was on hand. The menu was made of products of Blackdom. Then we have the Artesia Pecos Valley News dated November 11th, 1915. A number of residents from Black, the Blackdom settlement up the valley came to Artesia Saturday afternoon and put on a very credible performance in the Coring Hall that night. The receipts went to the building fund of the Blackdom Church. It is the intention of the troop to give concerts at other places in the valley. So they were fundraising for uh, the church. This one kind of pulls at my heartstrings. The ladies uh, by then were getting into World War I and they are working on things to send to the soldiers to contribute to the war effort. And this uh, is an article, Roswell Daily Record, dated October 8th, 1917. And it's titled Red Cross Scrub Cloths. The Red Cross unit of Blackdom are doing a fine work. Yesterday, six scrub cloths were brought up and are now on display in the window of the Roswell Red Cross workroom. See them. These scrub cloths are a much needed article in base hospitals. The women of Blackdom have banded together themselves and knitted 30 of these scrub cloths. The local chapter urged that every household in town send to them all the old rags, either white or colored rags for making of these scrub cloths. A box is arranged to hold the rags and the women of Blackdom will call for them. Remember that it is sinful to burn waste wet rags that may be utilized in scrub cloths for the hospitals for our sick or wounded soldiers. The Blackdom women in charge of the scrub cloth knitting are Ms. Dames, S.M. Boyer, L.H. Henderson, E.K. Allen, Harriet E. Smith, Frank King, Malone, and Super. Uh, and then the next one is still about the scrub cloths. They did Roswell Daily Record, August 31st, 1917. Yesterday, the Red Cross chapter of Blackdom sent 20 more beautiful crocheted hospital mop cloths to add to their collection. This Red Cross unit of Blackdom is doing a beautiful work of service in their humble way for God and humanity. Then moving on, in which I didn't know this, and I, I wanted to have a conversation with Tim about it, but I didn't have time. I just ran across this one about a road being built, uh, supposed to be built close to Blackdom. And this came from the Hope Pinasco Valley Press dated November 18th, 1916. And it's titled, How the Proposed Road Will Come to Hope from Roswell. Now that there is another proposed railroad coming to the Valley Metropolis, and it looks very much like a certainty, and the fact that Roswell, with a straight bonus and having nothing to do with the right of way into and through the city, speculation is on as just to what route the road will come into the city and what route southwesterly to El Paso. Right now, it seems that the road will likely touch Tatum and come through Clark's Gap at the John Fusen Ranch and at the Caprock. 
Just to let newcomers know and to refresh the memory of old timers, here is the route that proposed Kennedy Road was to come into Roswell. From the Pecos River striking the canal one half mile of Second Street down by the LFD lane, thence by the Barnett Brick House and the Clardy Dairy and up Bland Street into the city. It was described then that the yard terminal should be on South Hill. It was talked of then that the road would leave Roswell for El Paso going by Southside store and go via Hope connecting up at El Paso for a direct outlet into Mexico City and that a big trunk transcontinental railroad is back of the deal. Um, Miss Missop is sure that the road will be built onto El Paso. It is stated on good authority that the ultimate purpose of the proposed road through Roswell and is uh, Mexico City and an outlet to the California coast. It is stated that within 60 days, Roswell will have another railroad proposition to consider, one coming down from Torrance connecting with New Mexico Central and running the coal fields of New Mexico. So this road was uh, supposed to go right by Blackdom, which would have been a huge benefit for them. Uh, Shannon. And then, yes, am I out of time? Um, you are approaching time. Um, we do have a question about a screen share of any of these. Um, if you could screen share any of these uh, newspaper clippings, um, if that's possible as you're reading them. We have time for one more. Um, actually, I can I can email that. I'm working off of two computers because my audio wasn't working on the other one. So um, I would love to do that, but I can't do it right now. But I will be happy to. <laughs> I, I can I, I can show would, some of them. Some of them that she mentioned I have in my presentation. So yeah, it, Tim. Okay, you'll good, see some good, of them. Good. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry, Tim. I hope I'm not doing too much of your stuff. No, not at all. <laughs> you good. Okay. Well, my last one I have, and this one is it pulls at my heartstrings too. It's it's um, the Albuquerque Morning Journal, August fifth, nineteen twenty two. Cottonwood people dedicate a church. Methodist of the Cottonwood section conducted opening services in their new church building last Sunday with a large crowd of Cottonwood, Artesia, and Lake Arthur people present. The church building was purchased from the Blackdom community and moved about eight miles from Artesia. Reverend J.C. Jones of Roswell, presiding elder of this district, preached at the morning service. A sumptuous dinner was being served on the ground. So at this point, Blackdom had sold their church to Artesia and had uh, closed. So I will let everybody else have their turn now. So thank you so much. Thank you, Janice. Um, I will, uh, for people who are asking some questions in the chat, I will um, address those once everybody has, uh, has finished up their presentations. Okay. Um, thanks a lot, Janice. Uh, Thank you. Up next, I am excited to welcome Dr. Timothy E. Nelson. Dr. Nelson is a historian, a professor, and philosopher whose multifaceted work concerns racism, ambition, and the search for opportunity. These themes were revealed in his 2015 PhD dissertation, The Significance of the Afro Frontier. Dr. Nelson was born in South Central Los Angeles and raised in Compton during the early 1990s in the wake of race and class-based conflict with the LAPD. He earned his PhD from the University of Texas at El Paso. To learn more about Dr. Nelson's research on Blackdom, check out blackdomthesis.com. We have had some links in the chat I will um, link the full URL now. And Dr. Nelson, take it away. Thank you all for being here. I'll get right into it. Okay, so tonight I want you to consider from where did Compton get its cowboys, okay? The summer of 2020 began with racial violence similar to the assaults perpetuated during the summer of 1919, a period often referred to as Red Summer. Black people on horseback, born and raised in Compton, was a vivid show of anti-racist force. 
June 9th, 2020, Black Cowboys and Cowgirls from Compton graced the pages of the New York Times under the headline, Evoking History, Black Cowboys Take to the Streets. For people who grew up in the Hub City, it was more of our reality. Leaving the Afro frontier to occupy spaces in places like Southern California, Harlem, Oakland, to engage America's roaring 20s, Black cowboys continued to maintain a vibrant culture amongst themselves. A historical narrative sickness has concealed a brief period at the turn of the 20th century when Black people preserved their internal structures behind the Du Boisian veil of double consciousness. We won't go into detail about the Blackton thesis, but I want to emphasize this is where the Black ministers, military men, and Freemasons came from, and that is during the American Revolution. Okay, so that's what's important here. We, if you have questions, we can go through them later. Blackton was a real place located in the southeastern section of the New Mexico Territory. The Afro Frontier Town was part of a Black colonization movement that happened over the course of a century. It operated on a continuum influenced by ministers, military men, and Freemasons. There were others, but I, I, I shrink it down to those three to give us uh, something to anchor uh, uh, what we're talking about. After the Plessy decision in 1896 established the separate but equal doctrine, Black institutions evolved to take advantage by encouraging a separate and equal response. Blackton was a real place that started with an inherited idea of the Afro frontier town, manifested at the turn of the 20th century for African descendants under the conditions of American Blackness. In the 20th century, although Blackdom existed as a town for a brief moment, self-determination and how to achieve it were exemplified in the experiment. Significant to the Black and ambitious, Blackdom town site was a proof of concept for how to deliver on the promise of God's sovereignty. Now, Speaking of sovereignty, let's focus in here uh, quickly. Uh, the muscular reservation, I know the, the, the tag is here. However, if you go all the way into Roswell, all the way to uh, the Pecos River, Artesia, that is also the muscular reservation, just to uh, point that out, okay? So in practice, Black Demites pulled their land to build a 10,000 person all Black municipality. At the core of their movement was the exploitation of land through the homestead process. In 1900, Black people totaled less than 100 in Chavez County, and most of them were represented at the beginning of the colonization scheme. And I just want to show you here, uh, this is the census records here, and this is about 84. <laughs> From the state of Washington to South Carolina, Black Demites advertised the organizing of an Afrotopia. And because Janice did such a great job, we won't have to read the ad because it's here. And it was in South Carolina, not just Santa Fe, but it went all the way from coast to coast. And again, Janice spoke of uh, the Santa Fe New Mexicans uh, September 9th, and we won't have to go through that. Thank you, Janice. Uh, uh, we, we usually don't get a chance to read all of them, but this is what Janice was reading when she was talking about uh, the Santa Fe New Mexican. Okay. These are homestead records. Isaac Jones, uh, Blackton Townside Company's first vice president, began his homestead in April of 1903. In 1905, Isaac Jones was the first Black Demite co-founder to complete his homestead. The basic process took three to 10 years. This is the certificate. Uh, let's see who's the president, because the president signs homestead records. We can go to that later to see. Ah, we'll find the president later. Okay, so 
what I want you to clue in on is question number eight. If we are going to discuss Homestead Records, I want to cover this where it says, no, sir. And you can see the question is, is your present claim within the limits of, and we can get into that later. Okay, Blackdom was revived as a way to mitigate the impact of New Mexico's impending statehood and the shift from federal to local power. It's a big deal, federal to local power, state from territory to state. Blackdom's elite owned land, but only land wasn't enough to realize their Afrotopic dreams. Located 20 miles south of Roswell, Blackton was a small enclave of land owning black people. Blacktonites needed a collective action to deliver on the promise of their intersection. During Blackton's revival after 1909, Blackton included the significant striving of black women as they began participating in the homestead process more fully. Maddie Moore, Pernicia Russell, uh, Ella Boyer, were a few who chose to engage the world as part of Blackdom's homestead class. Blackdom's growth intensified with passage of the Homestead Enlargement Act of 1909. The township increased enough that the Blackdomites organized a school and reached out to the territorial government uh, for curriculum. And here's the uh, Enlargement Act over here. And this is what uh, Blackdom looks like in the 13th draw over here. This square inside of a square, that's 40 acres. And you can see it's also uh, the Roswell Correctional Facility is on Blackdom land. This is the census of 1910. You can see, and this is the uh, Boyer family, including the uh, Daniel Keys, uh, uh, who was married to Boyer's sister. Okay. Now, revival included educating the next generation by also projecting an intersectional blackness from behind the Du Boisian veil. For two years, Harold Coleman, a newspaper ads man from back east, particularly New York, but he was, uh, he traveled, um, he took over the advertising campaign published in the Crisis Magazine. Separate and equal, Black Demites projected intentional Blackness and God's sovereignty. After a few privileged Black travelers reported back to the migrating ambitious Black masses, Blackdom became a beacon for the illuminated. And uh, because Blackdom, they wanted a school. They were educated Black folks on purpose. In revival, Blackton became a real place and more than a refuge. Blacktonites preferred farmers to city folk for the sake of increased production. Everyone was required to adjust to the steep learning curve of dry farming. The agricultural society was a community set on living by God's divine laws of sowing and reaping. That's why they wanted farmers here. Farmers preferred, it wasn't just a refuge. Seed time and harvest time were different on desert prairies, but the ambitious frontier scheme was refined into a process uh, with predictable outcomes for investors. And you can see here, this is the homestead record for the 40 acres that I showed you in 1914, it was officially established. There's a reason why there's a time lapse. We can get into that later. Uh, it had more to do with the um, uh, process of homesteading. Um, the Rio Grande Republic reported George Malone, the first Negro to become admitted to the uh, uh, New Mexico bar in 1916, August 11th. Blackton's revival backdrop included the Mexican Revolution raging in the borderlands at the, uh, U as the US entered uh, into World War. Pushed to the forefront, Black children were conscripted into military service. People under the conditions of American Blackness, patriotic to a separate but equal system, Black Demites put the future of the small village on hold and shifted their activities 20 miles north into Roswell. In Roswell, many more went from 
famous and hyper visible to infamous. As patriotism fueled the war effort, the new era became a rationalization for raids on her body business at 201 South Virginia Ave. During the shift to Roswell, the image of Black people was under assault across the world with D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. Black bodies were under constant threat in the second wave of the Ku Klux Klan. In the Roswell Daily Record, Roswellian leaders advertised the showing of Birth of a Nation and offered lectures on Americanism, which was grooming for the incorporation of a Klan chapter in the city, which is unique because New Mexico was not friendly so much to the Ku Klux Klan as its neighbor, Texas or Arizona. Many more became the antithesis of the new patriotic fervor of the citizen soldier. She occupied the black female image in the region. Meanwhile, in July of 1921, 1917, the Roswell Daily Record reported Ezel Ragsdale had been drafted from the unincorporated Afro frontier town and the family prepared him for deployment, which included putting his homestead process on hold. This is where Janice did us a big favor. I'm just gonna show you this. While that was happening and all that was going on with Mitty Moore, this is the uh, uh, inter-ethnic bandage knitting party uh, and, and, and which was read by uh, Janice Forrest. So thank you for that. Meanwhile, in 1917, Mitty Moore was on trial for attempted murder of her fiance. Put two holes in his coat, didn't even touch him. Here's the great part, she got off. Well, great for the story, I guess. <laughs> Maybe not for him. Um, Mitty was on the margins of uh, Blackdom society and Blackdom women were uh, in her periphery. Mitty stayed unaffiliated prior to 1919. 1919 is important. Even though she began a homestead in 1915, three miles south of Blackton Town Square. She needed witnesses to vouch for her homestead progress under the threat of perjury, yada, yada, yada. In the spring of 1922 that Janice talked about, the selling of the church, uh, Mitty completed her final homestead proof for a whole square mile, and by the summer, Blackdom sold their church, and then the town faithful migrated outward. Ella and half of the Boyer family moved to Vado. Lastly, the beginning of boom times, the beginning of the Roaring Twenties, and I'm going to zoom in here because I want you to see it so you can say you have seen it. December 31st, that is a three instead of a two, December 31st, 1919. The Roswell Daily Record reported that Black Demites will pull acreage. Uh, you can read it. I'm just going to read the first uh, sentence here. The Black Dem people are making final agreements to pull their land. It's kind of hard to see. And when it is all in, they expect to have an excess of 10,000 acres. They're pulling their land to incorporate the Blackdom Oil Company. So December 31st, 1919, the Roswell Daily Record reported the pooling of land in order to incorporate the Blackdom Oil Company. So that is uh, uh, my presentation for today. And I'll back to you. Thank you so much. Um, there have been a lot of uh, questions in the chat about um, getting the dates of the uh, these newspaper clippings, um, which if Janice emails me, then I can email to everybody who has joined us tonight. Um, in particular, the, though, if it's off the top of your head, Janice or Dr. Nelson, the date of the newspaper clipping about the school, do you, the year? 19, 1910. 1910, thank you. Yeah, we can go, let me just go back to it and make sure. Um, we'll, we'll get to it, we'll get to it. I'll, sh yeah. I'll show it while somebody else is, yeah. yeah. I don't wanna take up the time with that, but. <laughs> um, so next up, uh, we will hear from, um, from Jeannie Flores, who is the coordinator of bilingual and teaching English as a second language education at Eastern New Mexico University. 
She is a former instructor of multicultural education, including the multicultural heritage of the Southwest. She has studied Black Dem at length and has presented over this topic at the university and public school levels. I'll let Jeannie take it away. Thank you so much. I'm very excited to be here. I appreciate all of you being here and I'm honored to be on this panel with such esteemed colleagues. Um, yes, I do teach at Eastern New Mexico University. My field is bilingual and ESL education, but for 15 years I also taught the diversity and multicultural education classes here at Eastern. Um, I have found that Blackdom has fit perfectly into the teaching of multicultural education, and I will elaborate on that. Um, I first learned about Blackdom when I was attending a Juneteenth celebration down in Hobbs, New Mexico, one summer in the early 90s, and somebody mentioned Blackdom, and I became interested, fascinated, wanted to know more, and began to seek information everywhere I could to learn as much as I could about the settlement of Blackdom. At some point, I was put in touch with um, Reverend Abuka Sumo, who had a church in Roswell. And the exciting thing was that several of the members of his church at the time were descendants of the Blackdom community. So that gave me an opportunity to connect with these descendants and talk with them, interview them, and, you know, add to my understanding of the community. And in fact, that experience working with the people from Reverend Abukasumo's church led to what became an annual field trip for my multicultural heritage class. It was a graduate class of teachers learning about multicultural education and how to incorporate it into their classrooms. And so um, we would take an annual spring field trip to Roswell. Uh, the people of the church and the other descendants who came to those meetings were so gracious in meeting with my students and helping my students to learn all they could about the community of Blackdom. We'd also pay a visit down south to where the uh, the former church is located. It's now a private home. So the poor family that lived there would get up one morning every April and look out and see us all sitting across the street in lawn chairs, <laughs> staring at their house and having a discussion about it. Um, but they too ultimately were kind to us about that. Um, so this, this, this though led to my students having a deeper understanding of Blackdom, of the story of Blackdom, the community that it is. And the, my thinking in this was to try to help them to incorporate the story of Blackdom into their curricula. Um, multicultural education is another area of interest and study for me. And I don't look at multicultural education as a study of culture. Um, to me, it's more the incorporation of cultural, cultural perspectives into the regular curriculum so that when teaching, we normalize culture. We don't have special cultures that we celebrate at certain times of the year, which is what we've kind of been forced to do. But instead in a curriculum, we can look at the inclusiveness of culture and how we've all been contributors to the country we currently live in. That's good for kids to be able to see themselves and their own contributions in the curriculum, as well as for kids to be able to see the contributions of others in the curriculum. So Blackdom lends itself perfectly to this idea. For example, if a teacher is teaching about westward expansion, um, it's certainly important for kids to know that pioneers were not all white folks in covered wagons, but that a variety of people came west and came west for a variety of reasons, some that all had in common and some that were quite different. So a multicultural lesson on westward expansion could, for example, include Mormons coming west because they were escaping religious persecution, white Europeans coming west for a variety of reasons that included land ownership and, and you know, a desire for uh, adventure, black folks coming west specifically to escape persecution and prosecution, uh, at one time to escape slavery and later to escape Jim Crow laws, but that we all had a hand in coming west and encountering a new lifestyle as a result of that. One could study the dangers of westward expansion and westward mobility. Um, for example, again, Anglos traveling west or white folks traveling west had to worry about 
Native American invasion. And in a multicultural curriculum, you would also look at why would that be and, you know, people protecting their lands, etc. But then Black folks coming West had to worry about white folks because that was a danger. And again, something to be looked at and studied, in my opinion, so that kids can understand kind of the combined history that we all share, what we've had in common and what has been different along the way. Um, creating community. How do we create towns out of nothing? Again, Blackdom lend its, lends itself perfectly to this. Um, and one could, in a multicultural curriculum, look at what are the needs of creating a community? What are the infrastructure needs? Obviously, we've got to think about water. We have to think about um, safety. Uh, you know, we have to think about the types of homes we can have in different communities. So in a multicultural curriculum, one could study, for example, the Pueblos. Why are they located where they are? Uh, why are the houses as they are? Where's the water source, et cetera? And then Blackton fits in perfectly with that. Um, why the choice of a location? And here is something that also should be included is that the original Blackton location was gonna be much closer to Dexter, but they were politely put invited to move farther west away from white settlements. And so that put them farther away from the water source. And that resulted in the need for wells as opposed to being able to, to uh, rely on the Pecos River. But that westward expansion, <laughs> further westward expansion in the case of the town site certainly influenced where they ended up settling, um, not by their choice, but by the choice of those around them. And then such a lesson could be concluded with students looking at their own towns. How was your town developed? What were the thoughts behind where your town is located? What were the infrastructure needs, et cetera? So Blackdom to me just lends itself perfectly to multicultural education and looking not just at culture, but at cultural perspectives on all of the aspects I've just discussed. And there are so many more that could also be included. Um, so what I tried to get my students to understand as they would learn about the town of Blackdom was now you can teach about it, but you can also incorporate it into your classrooms because Blackdom to me is a perfect example of New Mexico history and US history and how all of us have contributed to the history of the country we all now call home. And so that's my introduction and thank you. Thank you so much, Jeannie. Um, and finally, uh, to finish up these great presentations, I'm delighted to introduce uh, Maya L. Allen. Maya is a PhD student in biology at the University of New Mexico who focuses on how plants cope with environmental heterogeneity and a particular underlying mechanism, phenotypic plasticity, which is the ability for a single genotype to differentially express alternative phenotypes based on the environment. In returning to her home state of New Mexico, Ms. Allen has also researched the history of Blackdom in an effort to rectify the erasure of Black botanical contributions and highlight the Black botanical experience. So Maya, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And thank you to the New Mexico Humanity Council for having me. And Marissa, thank you. And Dr. Nelson, thank you for connecting me so I could be here today. Um, so I have been working to really um, center my work on reclaiming the legacy of Black botanists and Blackdom in particular was such an impactful story for me when I discovered it um, because it was absent from my New Mexico history education. Um, I was born and raised here. And, and what Blackdom illustrates, right, is it illustrates a story of resilience. And it speaks to what our communities are going through now, especially in the face of climate change and variable monsoons. Um, Blackdom residents really were a resilient community. Many of these people moved across the country into an arid habitat um, with a whole different climate regime, and they had to adapt. And so this community was started, it was rooted in dry land farming. And like what that means is you're, you're reliant on having a wet season 
and you generally are relying on that precipitation, you can have some supplemental um, like irrigation, but for Blackton residents, they were gonna be too far from the Pecos River um, as, as was stated to really irrigate and capitalize on that water resource. So instead, you're cultivating your crops and you're really reliant on our summer monsoons here in New Mexico. Um, and monsoons, what happens there is that because you know it gets super hot here in summer and so our land mass is heating up and we have our air rising and what that creates is low pressure above our land mass. And so the Pacific Ocean, um, that air is in high pressured areas. So there, that air is going to come over um, to our area of low pressure and then we'll have water condensation and we'll have that precipitation. That's why we have monsoons in New Mexico. But we, if we look at the temperature and we look at the precipitation data for Blackton residents, they weren't always getting monsoons. They had a really severe drought in 19, 1916. And so what these residents had to do was be really intentional about what types of crops were growing. And so, and, and you know, and really capitalize on these techniques in order to have successful crop production. And so what, what is another great thing, and Jeannie really highlighted this, is that there's so many ways you can approach this story. Um, one of the ways that I've kind of looked at it, especially when thinking about Black botanical contributions, is that legacy of knowledge. Um, so one of the crops that they were growing in Blackton was sorghum by color. Um, and they, uh, there's a lot of different common names like millet is one of them. Some people just refer, refer to them as sorghum. Um, and so this particular crop was being grown in Blackton and we knew that Crutcher Eubank was, was growing this crop. And this crop was actually introduced to the Americas um, from West Africa. And we know that it's been grown in substance plots. So the plots that enslaved people can use to grow their own food, it was being grown there. And so that's such an interesting thing to think about. We had these people that were, were transversing this land and learning this new environment. And you see, you see those remnants of culture, right? Like of West African culture. Because a lot of times we think of, we think of slavery as a period of, of eradication. But again, that resilience comes in where these people are retaining some of that foundational knowledge. And not only that is that enslaved people were not only brought here for labor. There were intentional, um, intentional uh, basically people were intentionally brought because of the agricultural knowledge that they had. So for example, in the Carolinas, a lot of West Africans were brought to the Carolinas because they were very familiar with rice cultivation. Um, so in West Africa, there's a, a particular species of Oriza that's drought adapted because of artificial selection. Basically people cultivated a, a dry land crop from rice. Um, and so these people were being brought to the Carolinas to continue on that rice cultivation. Um, and so these are all really wonderful things to think about um, and really be conscious of when we're thinking about history and whose contributions are highlighted, whose stories get told. Um, and so I've been really trying to leverage this story because it's been very impactful for me and I recognize that it's it's so meaningful I mean clearly by our panelists and all of you here it, it there's so many connections that you can make um, to this story and so that's really what my my work has tried to do is, is make those connections for people but then also push these other goals of really highlighting that black people have existed in these spaces of agriculture of botany um, and that, and so that black children can see themselves going into farming or participating in hiking events, things of that nature um, in a safe and empowered space. Um, so that is, that is me. And I look forward to the discussion with all of you wonderful panelists and your, you all's questions here in the audience. Thank you so much, Maya. Um, I so appreciate the, um, I so appreciate all of your points about um, the perspective of biology and botany on this history is, 
is super important and it makes for a multifaceted so story. Um, and yeah, I'm so excited to, to dig in. Um, the first thing that I want to address and that I hope all of our panelists can, can speak to is, um, so Blackdom is, uh, is, is sort of founded or settled in 1903, which is before New Mexico became a state. New Mexico statehood was 1912. And so I wonder, um, you know, they, they decided to come to what was, um, I guess, a US territory um, and not yet a part of the United States. And this is interesting. And I wonder if anybody um, has any insight, any of our panelists have any insight, insights about that, especially as related to the Afro frontier that Dr. Nelson has, uh, has framed for us. I'll, I'll start it off in that uh, it really has to do with law and, and jurisdiction, right? Um, so as a territory, you are a property of the federal government, basically. And we understand that through uh, conversations about uh, Puerto Rico and, all, and, and the other Gu Guam and, and even Hawaii sometimes. <laughs> Alaska sometimes. So when they, so when the 1912 statehood is coming up, black people say we got to get our stuff together because the locals who were uh, ex Confederates or Confederate sympathizers would be in control of our lives, would be in control of our Afrotopia. So we have to take control of it and make sure that we get all of our uh, uh, um, ducks in a row, as to put it lightly. <laughs> I would like to add to that. Um, and Timothy and I have touched on this some in conversation. Um, I think if there was a, somebody looking for a thesis study, I feel like there could be a lot more connection with the Buffalo Soldiers and Blackdom than what uh, we know about right now. Then, you know, I have not had time to go into a deep study on that. It would take a lot more time than I have but I think it would be a great study. And I think there is a connection there, um, possibly with some of the residents of Blackdom, the reason they came out here, we know the Boyer family had that connection. There were Buffalo soldiers at Fort Stanton, which is only 60, 70 miles away. Um, so I feel like that could have had something to do with the progress progression and, and the time era as well. So I, I, I'll just follow up a little bit. I, I think the idea of studying the Buffalo Soldier connection is an interesting one. I think probably the Buffalo Soldier connection may have also been something to consider in the travels west because one of the things that um, black folks had to face in traveling west was encountering the military and the white military. And, and, and that, was, that was a dangerous um, prospect. And it would be interesting to find out in the situation where they encountered, because you know Buffalo soldiers were here basically to, to uh, at, at least at an earlier time, to clear the land of native people so that white folks could move in. And um, you know Buffalo soldiers were present, you know, during the Lincoln County War, et cetera. Um, but you know, were there encounters in the, that particular westward movement um, between um, black people moving west and Buffalo soldiers? That could be an interesting connection there. Um, you know, uh, Frank Boyer, just to go into a little bit of the history in case for some, some audience members who may not know, Frank Boyer, I, I'm sorry, uh, Henry Boyer uh, Sr. was out here with uh, Colonel Donovan's uh, army of, of, of uh, volunteers as a wagoneer, and he saw the, the basically the wide open spaces of New Mexico and brought the idea back home to Georgia that this could be a place where Black people could maybe consider coming to live in, in, in a free environment and pass that idea on to his family. And that was the original catalyst behind um, Frank Boyer making that decision to come to New Mexico specifically, um, even though at the time it certainly was a territory. And uh, you know that that, and then of course there were other specifics that 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 sort of pushed Mr. Boyer and Alan Keyes into deciding to leave when they did. Uh, specifically, witnessing the murder of a um, a barber 
um, a, a black barber by a white man at a time when a white man could murder a black man with no consequences, uh, whereas a black man could certainly not consider <laughs> harming a white person in any way without serious consequences. But that kind of pushed um, Frank Boyer toward fulfilling the dream that his father had always spoken of. And so, you know, coming at that particular time uh, was, was based on that series of events. A, a man who had already talked about New Mexico as a place Black people could maybe live free of persecution and prosecution. And then a series of events that led Frank Boyer to decide to follow that dream. What I, what I love about the uh, Blackdom narrative is that there are many family stories. So, uh, so for the record, the, re the family story is about uh, uh, Henry being a wagoneer. The record that I was able to scrounge up was that Frank actually platted Fort Huachuca in Arizona. And that's where, and this was in the late 1800s when he was a Buffalo soldier. And so after he was a Buffalo soldier, he uh, left from Fort Huachuca in the late 18, 1890s, went back to Georgia, jo joined the Freemason Lodge and went to Morehouse. That's where he trained as a minister. And then he decided to come back and he was a cook for Hagerman and for, uh, I I'll give you the other name, but he was a cook for the, the major moguls in, in, in Chavez County. So we right, have- yeah. Mm -hmm. A few narratives connected to how it started. The the Wagoneer one mm -hmm. is the one that I'm still trying to um, uh, uh, clamp down on and figure out where that 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 record is of him as a Wagoneer. Mm -hmm. But I but definitely the family is uh, the one that projects that particular narrative. But Frank definitely was at Fort Huachuca. And I appreciate that information because that is another piece of the puzzle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, while we're on the subject of uh, Buffalo soldiers and this interaction between, um, between the native people here in New Mexico, um, we did get a question earlier. Uh, what would have been the internal Blackdom narrative or stance? Um, what would that have been towards the Mescalero? Was there any known significant dialogue or interaction? Um, there, there wasn't a, a, a connection I have with in the record of a Mescalero Oil Company. So when Blackdom Oil Company was established, they did partnership with the Mescalero Oil Company. Now, I'm not sure who was a part of the Mescalero Company. I'm just assuming that it has to do with the reservation that they had their, their town on. So if that's one of them. Um, I would say as uh, people in the Christian church, they had the attitude of Christians um, looking at indigenous peoples as possibly savage or um, savage in the quotes, air quotes, uh, or through the lens of Christianity, which is everything who's not a Christian is a heathen. They even had that stance against other black people. So for example, Mitty Moore was a bootlegger and black people had just came back from a uh, uh, World War One in, in eight, 1918, 1919. Well, you go to 1927, they're having Juneteenth. Well, you know, Juneteenth is a party, right? Well, uh, when Blackton put out that they were having a Juneteenth celebration of the Jubilee, they said, keep your liquor over there. So they, they, they had a uh, idea of temperance and, and, and of the uh, Christian faith. So uh, they may have had a contentious understanding of their connection with the indigenous peoples and in the, in the land that they occupied. They were a microcosm of the uh, uh, larger hegemonic society. So. I do know um, at Fort Stanton, the black, uh, the Buffalo soldiers were pretty much respected by the Mescalero Apaches. They uh, were known for their fighting skills. They were known for being able to be out in the elements much longer than the white soldiers. Um, and in many ways, they were feared much more. Uh, they, the Mescaleros did respect many of the Buffalo soldiers. So I found that to be kind of an interesting connection. And I can't remember where I read that. I would have to look that up, but um, it was a story I came across. <laughs> 
That's interesting. I sort of see a connection between, um, or I, I can make a connection in my head about what Maya was saying about um, uh, the, the people brought over from West Africa are being brought over because they have a they have a knowledge circulation or they they could provide a knowledge circulation they had a relationship to the land and so there's something if the mescalero apache are um if there's this respect or, or this understanding of um or it seems that there's an understanding of the the relationship to the land that um the afro frontiersmen had um that maybe the the mescalero apache recognized yeah, the respect for the land also included their understanding of, 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 of Christianity. Like we talk about the Exoduster and the Exodus. What about Joshua? What about, oh, now we have to enter into the promised land, not just get to, getting to the promised land was to Chavez County. Now we're talking about what do you do when you get into the land? What, 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 what traits are you going to adopt? What are you going to? So now, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on my soapbox now, but we're, you know, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I, I was going to talk more about uh, Pastor Eubank. See, you, you, uh, Maya mentioned uh, the Eubank family and an article is coming out soon uh, where I'm talking about the Eubank family and they suffered tremendously because they had faith but they had faith and sold seeds in the wrong place at the wrong time. Even though it was the right crop, it was the right crop for this particular arid region, it just didn't work because they did it in the cold instead of uh, planting it in the warm. So even if you have faith, even if you have all the enthusiasm, you still need the science. So that's why I'm so, so, so happy that Maya is here to talk about. And there is a question specifically for Maya um, in the chat. Did the residents have, the Blackton residents, have a connection with the native plants by harvesting or using them? Um, not that I'm aware of. So there are a lot of like wonderful species in the flora that's in southeastern New Mexico that are helpful for like, I mean, at that time, their, their environment was dominated by um, blue grandma and soap tree yucca, right? So you could you could certainly use those plants for things, but I haven't seen records or anyone else mention in their research that there was that utilization of species that were native to southeastern New Mexico or to the desert um, southwest. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and continue on with these. There are so many questions in the chat that I want to I want to make sure to get to all of them. Um, I want to circle back to a question from early, early on. Uh, was the purpose of the, the railroad to or the road to Blackdom close uh, to it? Was the purpose of it to bring or deliver supplies? Maybe both. But that's an open question to everyone. What I I've read. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, obviously, I, I can't speak to the purpose of it specifically, but I, um, there was a Black community in Raton that was looking for ways to send coal and other supplies down to Blackdom through the railroad. I don't think it was necessarily connected to this particular railroad, but I could be wrong. I don't know. Um, but that was one connection where they were attempting to ship supplies and, and at some point did ship coal to the Blackdom community from what I have read. And from the one article that I included, um, they specifically mentioned bringing uh, residents for Blackdom when they were just starting. The, they wanted people to come and bring their livestock. They even mentioned the swine and the cattle. Um, and I can imagine that they would want to bring household goods and that sort of thing. It was a hard time to get across the country and, and get that stuff here, it, you know, for them to escape the South and come out and start a new community, possibly even some of their seed crops, I don't know. But um, yes, there was a, a huge purpose for that. Southeastern New Mexico at the turn of the 20th century was the economic engine for New Mexico. Um, and you, you, you had a lot of, of political power, um, financial power, generated in southeastern New Mexico. And so for Blackdom, if you look at where it is, it is 
about 10 miles uh, east of the Dexter train station because there's a train station in Dexter and Roswell. So Roswell is only 20 miles north. The trains were connected to uh, the cattle industry. So what you have, the reason why that road is important, that road uh, is 285 that takes you all the way to Santa Fe, New Mexico. So you're talking about black people figuring out where the next new place is going to link itself to the center of power and the center of sending uh, uh, goods down into Mexico. Remember, they also had to send people into, new Mexi in, into Mexico. So in my dissertation, uh, there was a problem in Oklahoma and there was a lynching, yada, yada, yada. We have to get this family out of here and into Mexico and into safety. Well, that train took them through Blackton. Blackton was a stop to kind of make sure it was, okay, kind of an underground railroad, but it's literally above ground but it's blacked them. So there was a lot going on with that road because that road connects Roswell to Artesia too. So. Um, there's also some in the chat right now, there's um, some discussion about the why blacked them is no longer extant um, and why did the, the denizens of blacked them decide to leave? The Great Depression. Uh, they they switched from an agricultural uh, society to a uh, oil exploration company society. And you see what happened when everything froze in Texas, and the guy got like sixteen thousand dollar bill. Well, you know things. Uh, 1929 crash ended the ability of the exploration companies to get free capital to invest and lease land from black demites at the premium price. But they continued leasing land at the reduced like 90% price and black demites continued uh, to get oil royalties well into the uh, World War II era. So that's uh, a long version. <laughs> Yes, and, and there, there was also drought, you know, which, was, which contributed tremendously to the failure of Blackdom, sadly. Um, there uh, was alkali in the groundwater, which ultimately caused failure of crops along with drought. Um, and then, you know, as Dr. Nelson was saying, um, the 1929 crash, there was, there was a, 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 um, an increase in the price of wells and um, a lower water table, which also resulted in people not being able to get the water they needed. Yeah, I, like, I wanted excuse to me. share. Oh. Go ahead. Um, I wanted to share this real quickly with you all. So this is data um, from um, PRISM. It's like a really wonderful website that you can get all kinds of temperature data from. Um, so you guys are seeing this, the full screen? Yes. Okay, yes. wonderful, thank you. Um, so this is the precipitation data um, so here's precipitation in inches on the y-axis. On the x is all of your years. And then the colors are your average temperature. So that the drought was from like the year 1916 going into 17. And so here at 16 inches, that's where dryland farming is really sustainable. This is a huge plummet. And that is really going to contribute to if you like, I mean, rebounding from this, yeah, even having yeah. a good year in, in 1919, I mean, this, this was huge. Like this was a re really detrimental, that is like absolutely hardly any rain. And then um, it was already mentioned, but like that increased alkalization of the soil um, as a result of the water table dropping, you, you couldn't farm, you couldn't farm for those few years. The beauty of that happening in 1916 the U.S. went into World War One, and so now you have Eustace Boyer and the and the family being, uh, well, helped by those um, those the, the the money from being in the military. So the military benefits; they were able to get more land. They were able to, so that's how they were able to sustain through that drought, partly because they were getting federal funds. You have the New Mexico Military Institute getting involved. So you have a new economy, war economy, building in Roswell. So they were able to put their land on hold until 1919, for the most part, 
when they struck oil. Well, you know, leasing land struck oil. So. I would also like to add to that only because I had uh, most recently, which has actually been about a year ago, uh, a descendant that walked into the archives and she had paperwork. She was probably in her mid seventies, I would guess, but she had paperwork that her grandfather, I believe it was, maybe great grandfather, they still have the land. They still own the land there. They were looking for the land. They had come, I think she was from Missouri or Kansas or somewhere, but um, sadly, I wasn't able to help her a lot. The, the land that their ancestor owned was inaccessible. There was no road to get out to it. They do have the plot. They did go to the county offices, but uh, which is neither here nor there, but but there are descendants that still own land out there. Yeah, the Eubank family. Uh, we were talking about Crutcher. He he he's the he's the savior here. Uh, Crutcher. He ends up with uh, Blackdom's forty acre uh, town square. It's quick deeded from uh, Boyer in in, in nineteen twenty six. Um, but the Eubank family today, I think, currently has uh somewhere around eight 800 acres or so still in the blackdom commons the original blackdom commons um and there are a few other families i could talk about but the eubank family has the most that i know of so oh, like with, the, with the land out there being completely landlocked uh, which it is I, I i've hiked out there and it is completely landlocked um and, and and this is maybe it's inappropriate for me to jump in with a question but that's something i have wondered about is the people who do still own land out there that land is for them completely inaccessible is it not and how can that be worked with that was my problem with the descendant i i, I didn't have an answer for i didn't know i sent her to the county offices but um you know and they'd driven out there as far as they could but sounds you know, like I, government intervention or, or some kind of project for that in a perfect world i would like to see blackdom rebuilt and make it into kind of a blackdom williamsburg and have people visit and know what happened and know what lived and know the history and because I feel like it is that important. There was and a plan for plans. dedicating. Oh, I'm sorry, Dr. Nelson. No, 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 go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. There was a plan for actually dedicating a piece of land in Roswell to that very purpose and having a Blackton Museum. Um, unfortunately, uh, about the time that the plan that was really kind of coming together was when our previous governor came in and cut money for museums. And that dream kind of fell away at that time. Um, but their land had, you know, there was a there was a specific specific plot of land behind the military institute that was going to be the site of the Blackton Museum, and plans were underway. An architect was hired, the whole nine yards. But as I said, then the money wasn't there to complete that plan. But I agree, wouldn't that be wonderful? Yeah, we did have a question earlier about. Um about the, the land that Blackton was on and if there's any current plans with New Mexico tourism. Um, so maybe in the future, maybe the future will be brighter for that, the preservation of this history. Um, there is another question um, for Maya. Um, can you say more about what inspires you about the story of Blackton, how you see it fitting in as a contemporary model for resilient living? Um, there's a couple of things that are really inspirational for me um, that I think took a while for me to know, like realize the gravity and one was their community orchard. Um, so in, in multiple theses, this was mentioned and I, I was kind of like, oh yeah, that's wonderful that they had a community orchard and, but also it was mentioned when that worm infestation came in and destroyed the, the orchard. And when I took a look at what was being grown, I realized, oh my goodness, this was a huge commitment. Like you were coming into a new area, you're gonna, you're gonna take two, three years before you actually get apple fruits from that tree you planted, unless you're bringing in, you know, obviously if you're bringing in a mature plant. Um, and so I think that that was really inspirational to be dedicated and to make those investments and 
see it through until you get the payoff. Um, so that really resonated with me. But there's a lot of things about this story. Um, in, in terms of a contemporary model for resilience, um, I think just the the actual story itself, right, in like dealing with the worm infestation, dealing with all of these challenges that this, this community faced is really impactful. But now in what what farmers are are experiencing in New Mexico, so there was an article in the Albuquerque Journal. Um, what is time anymore? Maybe two, three weeks ago, but <laughs> how we're our real, this was before the snowstorm. So how the Rio Grande levels were so low, they were asking farmers not to farm unless absolutely necessary. So we are going to have to do something in order to ensure the livelihood of our farmers and our ranchers in New Mexico with climate change. And so I think that that, that story of resilience, like Blackdom experienced that drought of 1916 our monsoons are still going to become more variable. We're gonna see increased temperatures in New Mexico. So there is only so much you can do before you, the, the environment will decide it for you. And so I think we should really take that lesson to heart. Thank you for that. I think that's uh, so important. And I'd like to underline that absolutely for sure. <laughs> um, uh, another thing, another question that's coming up is about the, the fate, what happened to Blackdom Oil and, and wanting to speak to the fate of the Blackdom Oil Company. So the oil, the, the oil company uh, was set up in a way, can you hear me? Okay. The oil company was set up in a way that uh, people leased their land. So as long as you owned your land and you were able to lease it, that's how long it went. So. Uh, the royalties extended into uh, the World War II era. Um, around 1970, a, a, a lot of land exchanged hands for, I mean, pennies on the dollar, like $15 for 160 acres for whatever reason. We can, we can discuss that later. But Blackdom Oil uh, kind of fades after the World War II era, and I haven't picked up what happened to it. So there may be some a uh, Blackdom descendant, you know, who's uh, uber rich and owns Exxon or something. I don't know, but uh, but I, it's fallen off since uh, after uh, Boyer mentions it in his final uh, interview uh, in, in 1947. He was talking about Blackdom oil. So. And also on that, um, on this note of conti the continuation after the the drought, or maybe this was before the before the drought, but the move to Vado, New Mexico. Um, can anybody speak more to that? Um, Boyer, Boyer. Okay, so the Blackdom Oil Company is created December 1919. The Boyer family, half of it, uh, picks up and moves and builds a utopia in Vado, which is near the Rio Grande River, and it's a lot better for what they needed because they wanted the original idea for Blackdom, not some oil exploration, because back then it was really messy. I mean, it's messy now, but it was really messy then, uh, and, and, it, and it made it hard to farm. So they went to Vado and created their utopia, and uh, uh, in 1975, they started having um, the Henry Boyer uh, family reunion every two years, and they met in Vado. And uh, right now, uh, Ella and uh, Frank, along with the other family members, they, they sit uh, alongside I-10, uh, right in Vado, uh, near the gas station part. Uh, and you can see them at the Vado Riverview Cemetery. as well as at the Vado Church. Bingo. Mm -hmm. Oh, and, and also the son uh, is the um, de facto mayor of Vado or something like that. He's, a, he's the mayor, but it's Vado's a village, so it's not really a mayor, uh, what, the town elder. I don't know how they call it there. Um, but um, Vado and a couple of other things. Um, so Vado, like like Dr. Nelson mentioned, it was 
it was a much better <laughs> place to be farming. And so you could irrigate so that that being too far from the Pecos River was no longer an issue like they experienced in Blackdom. And then there's also um, it, the book is, uh, what is it called? A hundred, uh, 500, let me look. Uh, African American history in New Mexico, portraits from 500 years. Um, in that book, they talk about how Frank Boyer um, potentially was the first person to introduce cotton to Vado, New Mexico. And then he was definitely the first person to successfully farm cotton there. Um, so that's a cool tidbit. And I, I also just want to especially highlight um, something that was really important for me in Dr. Nelson's dissertation is that he really emphasized that Blackdom's story is is more expansive than just the story of Frank Boyer. And so we should think about the time in the town in terms of its own timeline, rather than when Frank Boyer moved to Vado, then Blackdom's stories uh, end. So I just wanted to point that out. And I, and I, and I want to respect uh, Doniana County because Dr. Villa, who uh, has since retired from New Mexico State, he will tell me and tell all of us that Black people did not bring cotton to Doniana County. It was around the same time that Black people came that cotton was there, so we still have to figure that out. But I kind of roll with Black people brought cotton. However, there is an alternative thesis by Dr. Villa, uh, the, the language professor at New Mexico State, and we have gone back and forth about it, but I just wanted to add that in there. I still, I'm, I'm with you and Glassrod's book, but you know, there are alternative ideas about how cotton got used. I agree. It's a, it will be a hard thing to cross-reference for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying though, I'm it's trying. One person, right? So, <laughs> you for sure. And I, I would like to add to um, another study that I feel like that could be done is, of course, we have the Mitty Moore, we have the Boyer family, but one that was almost overlooked was George Malone, which I've done pretty extensive studies on with, along with a couple of other ladies, but he actually was the first black attorney in the state of New Mexico. And that is huge. It's huge how he got his license. It's huge that he got out here. I think he helped the residents with uh, land issues and obtaining uh, grants for their for their land. And he was a teacher. His wife was the postmistress. So there's many interwoven stories of the residents themselves, which I think are important and we can't overlook them. 160 acres. He also was a homesteader. Yes. So for him to be intellectually bound to Blackdom, he was also physically bound by going through the homestead process. He could have just worked his intellectual economy, but he did even further. So it was it was interesting that he became a homesteader too. Yes. I think also the musicians of Blackdom. Oh, wow. um, you, you know, there's just, <laughs> you know, there's just so much there. They were very talented people. Um, uh, uh, Booker Collins, who you know was a bassist within in jazz, uh, a jazz musician, and you know played on on numerous albums, made his way to Chicago, um, ultimately back to Roswell. But you know, uh, there was just so much talent. And I think one of the things that to me is so interesting is the the talent, the creativity of so many of the people there, but you know, they had created, uh, you know, in, in the idea of the, the, the utopia, they had, they had created kind of a, if you will, a, you know, a, a Harlem on the, on, on, in the Pecos Valley in the sense that they were allowed to thrive because they were um, free mostly of white intimidation by black intellectualism. And, you know, that allowed a, a freedom to, to expand talents and to, to move into greater realms. And so I think Blackdom is significant in that way as well. Thank you for that, Jeannie. Um, and this, the Harlem of the Pecos Valley, Harlem in the Pecos Valley is um, such a great, a great phrase um, to, to think about. Since we are approaching time, I wanna end with two more questions. Um, one, another addressed for Maya, can you share more about black farmers and where Blackdom falls into the larger narrative of black farmers? Um, 
so in, in terms of it falling into the larger narrative, um, it, it depends on who, who we are talking about. So if we're talking about um, African Americans, then a lot of uh, the stories that we see, like Crutcher Eubank and Frank Boyer, um, they a lot of people had those ties to agriculture through their families. Um, so in the census records, we could see that Crutcher Eubank and Frank Boyer, both of their fathers and their father's fathers were farming. Um, and so that in terms of like the larger narrative is, is a commonality among African Americans in the US um, or, or the US territories. And in terms of black farming now, so we've actually seen a severe reduction in black farmers. Um, so it's, it's either like 1% or 1% to 2% um, in of America's farmers are black farmers now. In During blackdom, um, like around the 1920s, we had 14% 4, of our farming community was, was black. Um, so, so currently you're seeing a shift in people trying to, again, like reclaim that legacy and, um, and participate in that farming practice, especially because it's so familial, it's, it's in your history, right? Um, so that, that would kind of be the answer to that question. Thank you. Um, the final question that I wanted to end on um, was asked earlier, what can be done about reviving the museum plan for Blackdom and Roswell? I had there needs uh, to be money. <laughs> I had some descendants that had contacted um, Historical Society of Southeastern New Mexico. Oh, it's been five or six years ago. They still owned the church that was built. I believe it's on Alameda Street. It's, to my knowledge, it's empty now. Uh, the family owns it, and they were willing to donate the church to whoever um, would take, take it on and turn it into a museum for Blackdom. This was the family that came from Blackdom, their ancestors came from Blackdom, they built the church here in town. And I begged, <laughs> I begged the society to, to let's take it on, but we're nonprofit and there's just no money, you know, to do that. They would have loved to have done it, but it would have entailed a lot more. So again, I, I don't know who that goes back to. I'm wondering about the church and schoolhouse that's located now down north of Artesia. Um, that building, I, I, I would like to see that building on the National Registry. Mm. And I've been wondering for a while now how to get that done. And I don't know if anyone has ideas about that, but to me that that is an historic building. And that's the one that was moved from the Blackham Town site down to Cottonwood. And uh, it seems to me like that's that belongs on the National Registry of Historic we, Places. We need to do that pretty quickly. I think it was on the last time I saw it, there was a, a burn on the side. So it was almost burned uh, in the I think in the last year. Uh, I think, yeah, money's one thing. But the other thing is uh, uh, will. Uh, we need to have a new discussion, a new dialogue, a new dialectic. I don't know what level we have to talk on to understand that. Black bodies at this intersection is important, even though we have a tricultural narrative in New Mexico. Yes, that tricultural narrative has a lot of heat and energy going, but I promise you, uh, including Black bodies allows us to see the microcosm of what's going on in hegemonic society that we're trying to decolonize and all of these other ideas that we're trying to come up with. When we begin to include Black people, this minute population, we begin to learn a little bit more, not just about Black people, about the pressure that they had to face, which means that what? There's another ma ma marginalized community that probably faced a little bit more or a little bit less, but you can see it in that microcosm of Black bodies at the intersection of Mexico's northern frontier and Indigenous lands and colonized westward expansion. All of these things we can now uh, rediscover uh, now that we have a better understanding of, of what Blackdom is and the intersection that it, at, that it sits, so.
I think that's an excellent and profound line to end on. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Nelson. And uh, thank you everybody for your participation. It was great. I'm so glad that this uh, chat had such <laughs> amazing questions and it was going all night. So I'm so, I'm so glad that we got to have this, um, this live session. Thank you for joining. Um, one final thing that I'd like to add is, that, uh, is a survey from the New Mexico Humanities Council. Um, this is uh, the, audience the audience, all of you who participated and listened, a chance for you to give us your feedback, um, which of course helps us as, uh, as an organization. It helps us with um, our growth and development. Um, and huge gratitude to everybody again, um, Dr. Nelson, Maya, Jeannie, Janice, thank you so much. Um, be on the lookout for more Starting Conversations episodes on our YouTube channel. This uh, will be recorded and will be uploaded by the end of the week as well, if anybody wants to revisit or share. Um, and there will be some more live Starting Conversations events coming up later this spring. So thank you all so, so much. Bye for now. Have a good, have a good night.